Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Jacqueline Felcher, the Senior National Security Correspondent at Defense One, and I'm so excited to kick off the first session at today's Intelligence Summit. During today's opening keynote interview, you'll hear from Space Force ISR Chief about how the service branch is meeting its mission needs today and what's needed for tomorrow. With that, I would like to welcome Major General Leah Lauterbach, the Director of Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance at the US Space Force. Thank you so much for joining me today. Without further ado, I just wanna dive right in. I wanna start off asking you a little bit about current events and what role your office in space is playing in them. Uh, with American boots, without American boots on the ground, space and intelligence collection have obviously played a big role in what the public and the Pentagon knows about the conflict in Ukraine. So can you talk about how your organization has been involved the past three weeks and how space is playing a role in the war? Sure, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Jacqueline. Um, happy to do this and uh, really happy to talk about what it is that the space domain or what the Space Force is operating, how we're operating in the space domain and um, and how we plan to go forward with it. So, uh, and as you said, I'm the director of ISR, so very much um, uh, uh, concentrating on what we're thinking from an intelligence standpoint. Uh, so in the Russia-Ukraine crisis that we have today, I think it's first important to understand uh, the Space Force and the difference with Space Command, U.S. Space Command. Um, because the, all of the services, so the Space Force being one of the services, we um, op or organize, train, and equip uh, forces in order to present those forces to those combatant commands. And so today we're, uh, we are presenting those forces to U.S. Space Command, who then is supporting U.S. UCOM um, and, the, uh, and the whole of government, if you, if you will, as to what is, uh, how we're operating um, uh, to watch, observe, and then to support the crisis um, as, it, as it unfolds. Um, and so, of course, as you can imagine, the Space Force uh, missions that we execute today, uh, they're the same missions that we executed, you know, four weeks ago. Uh, and they'll be the same missions that we execute um, in a global manner uh, for any of the combatant, combatant commands. And uh, again, as a uh, Department of Defense or um, uh, for the, uh, for the, uh, government as a whole as to what it is that they require from space. And so primarily that's uh, you know, PNT or, you know, what I would call GPS, but PNT being um, positioning, navigation, and timing. Uh, it's uh, battle space awareness. It's missile warning. It's uh, things of those nat that nature. Communications, I say that's a huge one, um, that we support all of the other war fighters out there. Uh, and then Hence, we're also supporting U.S. Space Command and U.S. UCOM in, uh, in observing and, and watching and being able to try to characterize what is happening in the Ukraine crisis. So that's essentially what we're doing today. And, and hopefully that makes sense to how it is that we're presenting those forces to, uh, to U.S. Space Command. It absolutely does. Thank you so much for that great overview. Um, the, the war so far has really united so much of the West and, and so much of the world, really. I'm wondering in this conflict and beyond it more broadly, how how is your organization working with foreign governments and international bodies? Is, are there any you know concrete cooperations or how how does that intelligence um, get shared with other other organizations? Okay, sure. So um, so honestly, the uh, from an intelligence sharing perspective, that actually falls under uh, um, under the intelligence community umbrella. So the director of national intelligence maintains those. Uh, those authorities. And I can't really comment on what it is that we're providing or, or who, to whom we are providing, but I think you could, um, I can characterize it as we're, we're providing um, support to our uh, our partners, our NATO partners specifically, uh, and and to those that uh, that we believe um, have, a, uh, uh, have a vested interest in what is happening in Ukraine and, and Russia. Uh, so specifically for the Space Force, uh, the, the intelligence that we might be gathering, um, essentially we're gathering that for ourselves. Uh, and then again, for the broader U.S. Space Command and uh, U.S. UCOM effort. Um, and, and truly right now, as you stated earlier, with no boots on the ground, it's really a, uh, it's an under, trying to understand the battle space uh, and the battlefield and uh, prepare for um, anything that we might get called into action um, at a you know, future date. So taking a step back, I'm hoping to get sort of a 30,000 foot view to, to frame the rest of our conversation about what you see as the greatest threats that America is facing in space and sort of how you are preparing to, to face this new threat landscape. Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, so uh, again, I guess I, I would go back to just understanding what we do in the space domain, um, that we are enabling all 
uh, you know, all mission partners with um, uh, intelligence or um, uh, understanding of the battle space or communications, et cetera. And so we rely, our joint war fighters rely on the capabilities that we provide uh, and, and they have for years. Um, of course, uh, some adversaries or some foreign governments um, understand how we rely on that. And uh, so China is a perfect example of understanding and watching our capabilities grow and mature over, over you know, really since Desert Storm, Desert Shield. Uh, and so China over the last, um, I'd say I'd characterize it as the last 10, 15 years um, has truly modernized and built a capability, a counter space capability that would in essence take away our enabling capabilities for the rest of the joint force. So if you can just imagine, um, you know, the day without space is the day without communications on the battlefield. It's a day without uh, PNT on the battlefield. It's a day without command and control. And so the, the, the thought of that is, uh, it should be scary to every every person in uniform. Uh, and uh, and so we, we in the Space Force believe it is our, uh, our responsibility, of course, to uh, protect and defend. Um, what it is that we have on orbit. And so, so then I would go back to space as a warfighting domain. Absolutely it is. Um, and, and the threat really has presented itself to make it that warfighting domain. Uh, and so uh, General Raymond, our CSO, the Chief of Space Operations, uh, I, you know, when he stood up the Space Force, really his number one goal is to build warfighters um, out of the, the capability, the, the people that he has today. And so in my organization as a director of ISR, uh, and so, and I consider that, you know, I, I'm a director on a staff, but I, I consider myself to be the senior intelligence officer for the ISR enterprise in the Space Force. So, you know, around 800-ish people um, that are supporting, uh, uh, or they're doing ISR operations, and then of course, supporting other operations that are happening. So I think it's one of my, um, uh, one of my top goals is to ensure that we are going into this with a warfighting mentality um, as to how do we defend uh, the capabilities that we have on um, on orbit. And from an ISR perspective, that really, the, the truest sense of an intelligence officer or an intelligence professional is to understand the adversary. Uh, and so we, that's the first thing that we've got to be able to do is to, um, uh, to see and characterize, uh, identify what is happening either on orbit or if it's a counter space capability or something of that nature that's terrestrial on the ground that can affect us uh, on orbit. Th those are the things that we're looking at to, um, uh, uh, to build that capability, uh, war fighting capability for the Space Force and then for the Joint Force writ large. So if you'd like to meet, I mean, I can go right into the, some of the space threats. <laughs> We'd be happy to do so. Um, be, yeah, you know, and I, I've already uh, touched a little bit. Uh, China really is our pacing challenge. Uh, you know, Russia has been in the news quite a bit, not just because of the Russia-Ukraine, but, you know, if you, you just go back um, uh, six months ago, uh, and certainly with the Russians um, striking down one of their Air, or one of their spacecraft in uh, low Earth orbit and right 1,500 pieces of debris that uh, that is out there that we're tracking so far. Um, so Russia has been pretty pronounced as well. We uh, a couple of years ago they they launched a uh, an or on orbit right so co, co orbital counter space capability that um, uh, that we you know was really professional or uh, core professional behavior uh, that they were that they were displaying uh, and was very concerning to us that they had a uh, what we assessed as a, a counter space capability essentially flying near one of our capabilities and uh, and following us around and so uh, we you know so you heard about those things because they came out in the news and they were uh, they made the news and so folks are um, are hearing lots about that uh, and and you know, so of course, a threat or an adversary that we need to really clearly watch out for. Uh, but China is um, truly the the challenge for us. Um, I, you know, I could go through details as to the number of satellites that they have launched over the last number of years, uh, the, the number of launches that they had, you know, outnumbered the la non la uh, number of launches that, uh, that the U.S. had last year, as an example. Um, they are uh, they are putting up a robust capability, uh, not only from a counter space capability, but from their own space enabling capability. And I think it's important for people to understand it's it's not just about their counter space uh, that does threaten us, but it's also um, how they use their space capabilities, their intelligence collection capabilities, because what are they using that for? Of course, they're using that to track us. Uh, to watch us, um, to and then you know certainly to try to deter us because they uh, you know concerns us that they might be able to see us 
um, in a, you know, uh, in a regional fight type of thing or uh, just in a crisis or competition. So you've laid out Russia and China as the two biggest threats in space, which I think, you know, extend throughout the Department of Defense. And I, I'm wondering, you know, a question that's asked a lot of the broader Defense Department is how to balance those two challenges. How, how do you balance those two threats in space or do, do they have, you know, similar capabilities and pose similar threats so it's not as much of an issue in orbit? Right. I think I would say, um, as the, uh, the Secretary of the Air Force would tell us, is that uh, China is um, the concern for us. Uh, so, uh, and from a space, specifically from a space capability perspective, um, Russia is a, uh, is more of an actor that I, I feel is um, uh, uh, unknown and maybe more of a uh, concerned about being boxed into a corner type of thing. And so when you get, uh, when you get uh, somebody, uh, uh, an actor in, you know, backing them up into a corner, uh, you're not 100% certain what it is that they will do. Um, China, we believe, is uh, probably more of a rational actor at this point. Um, but as we can, we've, we've seen in all of their domains, uh, their their modernization uh, across the board is just, I mean, it's, it's incredible to see. And so uh, what does that modernization for them mean? Uh, well, we think that it means that, um, uh, you know, they're, they're being prepared for uh, either deterrence, a strong deterrence towards us or, um, or a, a, a conflict. Uh, and then eventually that goes past re regional um, uh, ideas for them, but then goes into, uh, you know, potentially global ideas. And, and they've stated that in their, right, in public speaking. So it's not that that's a surprise to anyone. So where the difference to me is, is that um, from a space perspective is that China has an overwhelming capability and they, they need it. They're, they're going to be at some point dependent on their own use for space. And Russia does not use it um, nearly as much. Uh, they, they are very good at what they do from a space perspective and a counter space per perspective, but, um, but they are less dependent on it and they've, they've decided to put their money elsewhere. And, and honestly, I think you can see that in the Ukraine crisis today is that they put their, uh, you know, uh, money into if it's a, you know, to support the ground war type of thing. So one of the challenges of these attacks you're, in space you're talking about, especially things like the, the co-orbiting satellite that you mentioned, um, is how, how to attribute attacks in space, how to know where they're coming from, who did it. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about challenges there and any new tools or capabilities you're pursuing to help with that. Yes, and thank you for the question because this is like at the right forefront. Uh, it's in my heart as to, yes, how do we, uh, how do we essentially sense that something is happening? Um, how do we identify it? How do we attribute it to somebody? And then how do we share that data? Um, the, uh, so all of that could be activity has happened. And so we need to sense that what we truly need to do is get to the left of that and be able to predict, right? Any intelligence officer or intelligence professional worth, worth their salt is somebody that is going to be able to provide indications and warning, uh, to the commander. And so, uh, I was out of us space command, uh, a couple of years ago, I was the, uh, the J2, or I was the senior intelligence officer for, uh, for us space command. And I could tell you, um, I get, uh, you know, on this uh, on this phone call, I can tell you that um, we just did not have the clarity um, and nor the confidence, right? So we didn't have the the ability that I felt that I needed to be able to tell the commander this just happened, um, and you know, this is who did it, right? So the sensing part of it, the identifying part of it, and the attri uh, the attributable part of it, um, I did not feel that we could do uh, in a in a timely enough a manner for um, for again a war fighting domain. Uh, now I've been in the Air Force for many many years, and I've you know lived and grown uh, grown up in the air domain, and I've seen it happen at, you know in the ground domain as well as well. Is that um, yes, when the commander needs to make a decision about what he needs to do, he or she needs to do that they've got to, it all starts with intelligence, and so um, we are we are not where we need to be. Uh, we are not where we need to be today, and and I just keep you know I continue to to hit that drum. Okay, so what are we doing about it? Uh, okay, so first and foremost, I'm very proud of the Space Force and the fact that they 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 understand the need for intelligence, uh, and so they have stood up. Right, they've they've we've stood up our directorate here. We have um, we did receive uh, more manpower um, to robust the capability for ISR within the enterprise. 
Um, we are, so we're developing and, and creating new squadrons at the tactical level so that we can, no kidding, do the intelligence collection and then uh, analyze that and then provide that intelligence to, uh, to the, the customer, the, you know, if that's the commander or, uh, or the operator that's sitting right side by side with me, whether it's a cyber person or a space person. So, uh, so I'm really proud that the Space Force has done that. So that's what we're doing here in these first few years is really building that capability. Um, at some point, Jacqueline, I absolutely, I absolutely want to get to uh, what does the force design look like for space domain awareness. Um, now we've had efforts in the space force where uh, space domain awareness, uh, you know, we're trying to pivot it from the old space situational awareness um, idea, and we've made some progress. And I mean, really, there's some great progress there. And again, getting into the mindset and the culture of building a warfighter. So I, I'm I'm happy that we're in this spot for space domain awareness now, but we've got a lot of work to do. And part of that, um, not just on the manpower and the culture piece, but part of that is what is the capability that you need. So when again, when I was at U.S. Space Command, and you know, there's just one one vignette that I would tell you that uh, I felt like what we needed was a persistent, uh, like a predator in space. Okay, I mean that's the simplest way for me to say um, I need something that's probably orbiting or is sitting really close to uh, whatever capability that uh, that that counter space capability might be, um, so that I can watch it consistently. There's so many things that are in space. There's no way that I would say, let's do that for everything, uh, but let's prioritize and figure out how it is that we, um, what are the most important things that we do need to be tracking and how do we how do we track those? So if it's not a single predator, maybe it's 15, um, you know, small orbital uh, capability or satellites that, uh, um, that, that we can use to, to give us that persistent look, as well as uh, the more high fidelity sensor that we need to, uh, to really attribute um, who just did this? Um, and again, like I said before, can we predict it ahead of time? Hopefully that uh, helps to answer your question. Yeah, no, that, that's super interesting. Uh, the idea of sort of these little little uh, satellites out there kind of keeping watch um, is, is very interesting. How, how far away do you think something like that might be? Years, decades, months? Oh, I think that, oh, that, that to me is probably years away. And, and here's why I would say, you know, just years. Um, the, the Space Force has some things that are really high, higher priority at this point. And so, you know, so we're working through that and, um, with, you know, the budgets that we execute and whatnot. Um, so when I say years, I don't think it's like, uh, you know, tens of years. I think it's just singles, single digit years. Um, but also, I think it's something that, you know, commercial capability, um, private sector can really help us with. Uh, I mean, the small satellites that um, that you know, are, are introduced and in, into low earth orbit as an example. I mean, they're, they're there, you know, industry is, is, you know, just essentially cranking these things out on a regular basis. Um, that helps us in, uh, you know, with technology development. Uh, and then it also helps us with uh, driving the price point down perhaps. And so I think that if we can collaborate with the commercial sector on this, and then uh, we need to do some of our own analysis and research to figure out how do we, um, you know, what is the best way about going going out uh, to do this? Then uh, I, I think we're I think we'll be there, you know, single digit years type of thing. That's a great segue to talking more about your partnerships with commercial companies, which is something I definitely wanted to ask you about. Um, hoping you can just expand a little bit on sort of how how you work with commercial companies, who you're trying to partner with, if it's sort of the names everyone might think of, if, or if you are looking to you know smaller more innovative startup types um, and, and why why you think these partnerships are important to your mission? Sure. So I wouldn't say that um, I, we in the ISR uh, enterprise within the Space Force is looking specifically at right X, Y, and Z. I would like it and I would prefer for it to be open. Um, I'm happy. Uh, I, I mean, I see industry folks come through my, you know, my office um, on a regular basis and uh, you know, pitching an idea here or there type of thing. And, and those, it's all great. It's, it helps me and my staff to understand what is out there. And then it also helps them to understand that, um, you know, here, here's kind of what I'm requiring. I, I mean, what, I, what do I need? I, need? I need more people looking up. I think there's a lot of commercial capability already out there. And then of course there's intelligence community capability and, and other service capability that is looking down and so I just simply say and ask, um, I need you to uh, to look up and then here's the vignette. This is why and this is uh, where we need to go. Space domain awareness, by the way, is is still the number one requirement and need by U.S. Space Command. 
Um, and General Dickinson just uh, spoke about that at, uh, at one of his testimonies just in the last couple of weeks. So there is certainly a need for it. I don't think that folks, um, uh, they might not understand that because maybe they haven't grown up in this space and in this uh, right in this uh, air or environment that we're in, and uh, and the understanding of the idea of looking okay uh, 400 you know 400 kilometers up or um, or really all the way out to geo at uh, whatever that is 47,000 kilometers type of thing you know that's not something that we we all think about on a on a daily basis. So to get back to your um, question, Jacqueline, I think it's more of, um, yeah, I want there to be open competition. Uh, we do have a um, an entity within the US Space Force that uh, that is really going out and, and asking for, um, you know, capabilities and uh, uh, and having these industry days, if you will. So really two entities that I would tell you about. One is the SWAC, the Space War Fighting Analysis Center. And then uh, the other one is SSC, uh, the Space um, Space System Center, right? Did I get that? Yes, <laughs> Space System Center out in, uh, out in L.A. Uh, but I am happy to entertain if folks, um, you know, in the uh, in the audience today, uh, you know, have a have something they think they're working on or would like to know more about to some more specifics. So pivoting slightly, I'm hoping you can give us an update on the status of the Space Force intelligence activity being established, as well as the progress toward the broader National Space Intelligence Center and, and where that stands. Sure, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So I was happy that we were able to stand up uh, the Space Force Intelligence Activity or SOFIA. Uh, we stood that up uh, this past September and it wasn't earth shattering. Uh, it was just it was a um, it was an interim step to get us to the National Space Intelligence Center. It was necessary. What it gave me was uh, what it gave us in the Space Force was um, more of a clearer line to uh, essentially the NASIC commander today, the National Air and Space Intelligence Center. Uh, commander, so that I could have a conversation with that commander about, hey, this is really where we we need the space, you know, the, those two squadrons that are operating and, and and focusing on space and counter space, you know, we really need them to start pivoting to or right working on a certain project, that type of thing. Um, and so in the uh, so that was the Sophia, and that was kind of our interim uh, the interim step. Uh, we do have a plan, and uh, we haven't finalized that yet, but I but I. I'm hopeful here in the next number of months, uh, we'll be able to uh, to finalize the plan and then be able to stand up the uh, the National Space Intelligence Center. Um, we're still going through uh, some of the analysis as to, uh, we think we know what the, um, what INSIC will look like in the very beginning, but the analysis that we're doing is what does uh, the fully operational capable uh, capability look like, right? That FOC, which which is will be years away, and that's absolutely fine. But we all expect that um, there is growth in this domain, and and it's driven by the threat. I think people need to understand that it's driven by the fact that you know China and uh, China specifically, but other countries. Um, are very interested in getting into the space business or are already very good at it. And so driven by that, that means you need more analysts um, and, and that would right, necessitate maybe some growth out at uh, the National Space Intelligence Center. So so that has that we have not worked all of those details out yet, but uh, but I think that initial operating capability is just a, a number of months away, perhaps. So the, the Space Force became part of the broader intelligence community, mm -hmm. the 18th member in January of 2021, so a little over a year now, what does that designation mean practically and how did it change? What's different now than in you know December of, of 2020 that in terms of how you do your job? Yeah, absolutely, thank you. I think, um, yeah, a lot of folks might not understand because the, the IC is this right huge organization and um, do you really, yeah, I, I remember getting questions in the beginning, do you really wanna become a member of the IC? And, and yes, absolutely. Now, while there are, there might be some, um, you know, challenges with becoming a member of the IC, um, the, the, you know, pros far out, or the benefits far outweigh the, um, uh, some of the negative things. The, uh, and those pros are one, you get a seat at the table. Um, so with the DNI, right, and with the heads of the um, the directors of the the combat support agencies. So if it's NSA or NGA, et cetera, um, that is in itself um, very helpful. Otherwise, I, I probably I wouldn't have been sitting at the head of the, you know I'm not at the head of the table, but I'm at, I'm at the table. I get to hear the conversations, and then of course I get to um, I get to advocate for for the space uh, for the space force and for U.S. Space Command and what it is that we think that we need. Uh, to uh, to be successful in this warfighting domain, 
And so, um, it, so that advocacy is not just about education for folks, but it actually, you know, turns into resources. That's manpower or money um, that would, uh, you know, that comes from various different uh, organizations um, within the IC. Then it's absolutely, those are the big wins, right? Those are the things that we need to, we get to prioritize ourselves uh, much higher than when we were actually prioritized in the Air Force, right? So the Air Force just had a lot of missions and space was one of those. And so now space gets to, uh, gets to prioritize its mission really as number one. And so that gets to rank uh, with all of the other service twos and, uh, and the, uh, the combat support agencies as part of the IC. So to me, it's just a really good thing. And, and I don't want the, I don't want it to sound like there's a lot of bad <laughs> or negative things about being in the IC, but as you are in any organization, there are just things that you have to work through and you get to, you know, there are a lot of meetings to attend that type of thing. Um, but we're working through all of those. I'm, I'm, I've been really happy. And I will tell you that director Haynes, um, she is so supportive and her staff has just been very supportive and, and um, you know, very collaborative with us. So uh, excited that we get to um, strengthen that partnership over the next couple of years. So one concern on Capitol Hill when the Space Force established its intelligence uh, branch or intelligence office uh, was duplication between the, the Space Force intelligence activities and the National Reconnaissance Office. So now that, you know, you've, you've been established for a while, you've been in the intelligence community for a while, I'm hoping you can give an example of areas that you have worked with them and areas that you have differentiated from the NRO. Okay, sure. So, I mean, to me, it's very, it's very clear, but maybe that's because I'm just sitting in it um, on a regular uh, basis. I would tell you first and foremost, the, the relationship that we have with the NRO, I, I mean, I think it's the, the best that it's ever been. Um, and I, I came from U.S. Space Command ahead of uh, now coming to the Space Force. And so the, um, uh, the relationship has only gotten better. And, uh, and so there, there's a very strong relationship from an operational standpoint, right? And acquisition, and then who's putting what up into, uh, up into orbit, and then who's doing what missions. From an intelligence perspective, um, it's a little bit actually clearer because the NRO, while they, um, uh, while they're a member of the IC and they do um, support from a collection standpoint, uh, it is not a uh, intel producing um, center. Uh, that th those functional areas belong to the combat support agencies, and so there isn't really a, um, a you know there's no butting of heads with uh, the NRO from from my perspective on an intelligence you know production basis. Um, as a matter of fact, I mean, it's just, you know, we collaborate with them on a, on a, on a regular basis. So as an example, one of the last, um, uh, we just uh, published, and I won't be able to, you know, show this to the, to the masses because of the classification, but uh, we did just pu publish our annual threat assessment. Uh, it was a congressional requirement that we had, and, um, uh, and we were able to collaborate with the, the NRO. We collaborated with U.S. Space Command, and uh, we're able to uh, publish the, the first of our annual, you know, our first annual uh, threat assessment. Uh, really, a, a threat encyclopedia is what we called it. And we'll do that on a on an annual basis. So we did very well in working together to ensure that we all agree to what it is that those um, uh, threats uh, look like out in the, out in the world. Um, and I can't tell you. Uh, I mean, from an operational standpoint, for sure, uh, the NRO can you know continues to work with the U.S. Space Command. So if it's from an operational, what you know, what do we do on a daily basis? Those are the two organizations that really have to work together. And then absolutely, we're working with the IC and the NRO specifically on uh, where do we go forward from a uh, from a uh, an IC uh, intelligence gathering capability versus what it is that the Space Force might want to do in the future. Uh, and so you've heard, uh, probably heard General Raymond talk about um, uh, tactical intelligence. Um, I'd like to call it just space-based intelligence, but the idea is that uh, you know each service has its own intelligence collection capability. And so in the Air Force, this is, it's called uh, it's called um, air breathers, right? Air breathing platforms that do collection. Um, the theater airborne ISR is what we call it. And so in that same sense. Uh, we, we think that there's probably a result or an area for the Space Force to uh, to build out a capability that does in intelligence collection for not just ourselves, but for the uh, the other services, the Department of Defense. Um, so we think we haven't right, sold ourselves on that yet. We're doing analysis right now to determine whether or not uh, we have a, a, a space there, uh, a, a place for us to uh, uh, to play. But we will do it 100 percent in uh, partnership with the intelligence community, uh, specifically with the NRO. 
Well, great. We are unfortunately out of time for today. What? Uh, I know th this that half hour just flew by. Um, so, so much, so many interesting things to keep tabs on going forward. Um, but thank you so much for, for joining us for this really interesting conversation. And one quick note for our audience, don't go anywhere. We've got a great day of programming ahead. Next up is our first panel of the day on harnessing data. Major General Lauterbach, thank you so much again. You bet. Thanks for having me. It's great to, uh, great to see you and everybody else out there. Thanks.